Hi, I'm Tawny Plattis, and you're listening to The Dirty Bits, the podcast that covers the sexy, scandalous, and salacious stories from history your teacher probably left out. We so appreciate all of the reviews you've all left on our Facebook and iTunes pages this week, especially because we're terrible at leaving them in return for our friends. (laughs) I'm so sorry, you guys. It's a terrible habit, and I promise I'm trying to get caught up on everybody. Swearsies. We wanted to read one review that really was so kind and connected with us from Oh Captain, My Captain. It's on our iTunes page, and it's titled History, The Way It Was Meant to Be Learned. One of the hardest parts of learning history is that it is often reduced to the whitewash of places and names. Places and names that hold very little reference to most of us, with the exception of those with a passion for history itself. There is nowhere for the rest of the people who might otherwise have an interest to plug in, so to speak, or connect. Well, the one place where we all connect is in being human. Finding common ground sparks interest. It sparks passion. For better or for worse, we find a little of ourselves in the characters of history. And that's where it gets interesting. Dirty Bits, as related by Tawny, gives us that precious gift. A place to plug in. Again, no pun intended. Well, maybe a little bit of a pun. A common ground on which we can explore fabric of time. The color of the background, the humanity that binds us all together. In the main character, or those involved in the story, There is some place to relate, and someone to relate to, and that is an incredible thing. For those with a passion for history, this is a feast without equal. For those with an interest, this is a treat. For those with a passing interest, but a short attention span, the Dirty Bits podcast may even serve to foster and grow your interest into a passion for the vagaries of the broad sweep of history. Go ahead, give it a listen. Share it, because it helps us all to be able to find ourselves in the greater fabric of life. Thank you so much for that glowing review. We're astounded and overwhelmed by it. Whoever you are, oh captain, my captain. And to all of you, thank you so much for leaving those reviews, sharing the show with your friends, and joining in on this community that we found ourselves a part of. We read each and every review, email, and comment. Our love bugs are the absolute best, and we positively adore you. Be sure to join us on social media, where we'll be doing giveaways of exciting new merchandise this week. On our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Dirty Bits Podcast, and in our Facebook discussion group, the Dirty Bits Podcast group, where we post art history memes and talk all things historically filthy. You can connect with us on Instagram at Dirty Bits Podcast and Twitter at the Dirty Bits Pod. You can also leave us a review on Facebook or iTunes. We love talking with our listeners and would be delighted if you joined in with us. You might even get a shout out on our next episode. All of our links are available in the show notes here and on our website, tawnyvoice.com slash dirty bits. We've also joined the Orbital Jigsaw Network along with some other shows we think you'd like, like Concession Stand, a high-energy, fast-paced, one-hour weekly show full of quips, jokes, and updates on all things geektainment. Centered around TV, movies, video games, and pop culture. Check it out at orbitaljigsaw.com. Many of you have requested longer, bigger, more frequent episodes. We would absolutely love to bring the show to you full-time. And if that's something you would like to see, you can help us work towards making that a reality by visiting us at patreon.com slash dirtybits and becoming an official Dirty Birdie. Every donation helps us achieve our goal of bringing more to the show, like animation, merchandise, and the ability to satisfy your every craving. A giant thank you to our newest Dirty Birdies who have donated on Patreon. We are seriously overwhelmed by your generosity and are so excited to start sending you all of the patron-only goodies we've been storing up. For example, this week, Stacy, who donated at the $25 level, gets an exclusive, extra, Patreon-only episode featuring Nazinga, Queen of Nadongo, and Matamba. Every one of your contributions to the show means so much, especially to those who aren't able to donate, and George and I can't tell you how much we appreciate it. 
Enjoy the show. James Augustine Aloysius Joyce was born February 2nd, 1882, but he went by James Joyce. He was one of the most influential authors of the 20th century, contributing enormously to the modernist avant-garde style. He's best known for the work Ulysses, a landmark work in which the episodes of Homer's Odyssey are paralleled in multiple literary styles, but most famously, Stream of Consciousness. He's also known for The Dubliners and the novels A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man and Finnegan's Wake. He's also responsible for creating some of the smuttiest, porniest, scatological, and ass fetishy letters I've ever read. James Joyce was born in Dublin to John Joyce and Mae Murray, the oldest of 10 surviving siblings. Surprise, surprise, the Irish Catholic guy had 10 siblings. His dad was a tax collector, a trait that seems to be common in the fathers of our Dirty Bits subjects this far, interestingly enough. The family was comfortably middle class and lived in the bougier town of Bray, 12 miles out of Dublin. But this all stops when John Joyce is published in the Stubbs Gazette for bankruptcy, which is actually a publication that gives all these details of court action taken against individuals and businesses, it's still published weekly in the Republic of Ireland. So John, James Joyce's dad, gets suspended from work and then is dismissed with a pension. This is when all the drinking and financial tomfuckery begins and the family just slides right into poverty. Growing up, James was also bit by a dog, giving him a lifelong fear of the animals. He was also scared of thunderstorms because his aunt had told him that they were a sign of God's wrath, as opposed to being the result from the rapid upward movement of warm, moist air because, you know, Catholic Ireland. He did okay in school, studied English, French, and Italian. He was active in drama and literary circles in the city, kind of dipping his toes into what would eventually become his craft. He eventually goes to Paris to study medicine for like half a second because the technical lectures were in French. So frankly, I don't blame the guy. I couldn't even figure out chemistry in English. But he's writing home that he's sick and it's too fucking cold, which seems weird for him to say coming from Ireland. And he gets this telegram that says, mother dying, come home, father. So he goes back home and his mother is like, James, make a confession and take communion. And James goes, no, I'm good. When she dies, James and his brother, Stanislaus, who wasn't a character in Game of Thrones, refuse to kneel with the rest of the fam fam as they're praying at her bedside. James continues to drink heavily because he's Irish and sad. Tony, Tony. Tony, what? son of a little racist. What? What are you talking about? You keep making these Irish comments. He was, he was, he was Irish. He was Irish. Yeah, but you're like he was Irish. Uh, <laughs> fine, fine, fine. What are you talking about? Fucking British people. British. Mm-hmm. Anyway. James is kind of hobbling along, reviewing books, teaching, singing to make money. In 1904, he began what would eventually become Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, and he also met Nora Barnacle. Nora worked as a chambermaid at Finn's Hotel and also worked at the bar. She was born in Galway to a 38-year-old illiterate baker and 28-year-old dressmaker, candle maker not included. She was sent to live with her grandmother and had a tumultuous childhood. She finished school at the age of 12 and began working as a porteress and laundress. She went to live with her mother, who had recently thrown her father out for drinking. She then fell in love with a kid named Michael Feeney, who quickly died of typhoid and pneumonia. And then in 1900, her boyfriend Michael Bodkin died. So her friends started calling her man killer because that's fucking hilarious. And James Joyce actually based the last short story in Dubliner's The Dead on those incidents. James said they met in 1904 on Nassau Street in Dublin. He saw this tall, almost five foot 10 young woman with a banging figure and amazing red hair. 
and just the way she moved her body was so attractive to him. She swang her arms when she walked. He would call it her saunter and describe it as proud. And supposedly what he meant was he saw a confident woman, a woman whose hips you could see swinging beneath her skirt. He liked the booty, as we'll soon learn. It was love at first sight, which also isn't saying much considering how nearsighted James was. Nora was also digging this slim, young, cocky son of a bitch who looked taller than he was and had this soft brown hair, a long, kind of sexy, starving artist type face, jutting chin, and these intense, pale blue eyes. Nora would always change the story of how she met James Joyce, sometimes saying he was wearing a sailor's cap and she thought he was Swedish, another time saying he had on a huge fucking white sombrero and an overcoat that reached his shabby ass shoes. So James goes up to her and is like, so, wanna hang out sometime? And she's like, uh, okay, yeah. But on the night they're supposed to meet, she stands him up. So he writes to her and he says, I may be blind. I looked for a long time at a head of reddish brown hair and decided it was not yours. I went home quite dejected. I would like to make an appointment, but it might not suit you. I hope you will be kind enough to make one with me, if you have not forgotten me. But Nora hadn't actually stood him up. She just couldn't get off work and wasn't able to let him know. And now that she had his address, because he had sent her a letter, she was able to be like, oh my gosh, no, 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 I'm so sorry, let me explain. And they eventually go on their first date, second try. <laughs> their first rendezvous was late at night in the deserted arbor, past the docks in Ringsend. They had this immediate chemistry, so Nora just took off his pants and, as James said, made me a man. Supposedly, their first date was Thursday, June 16th, 1904. It's assumed this because it's the date the events take place in his work, Ulysses, which chronicles the course of an ordinary day in the life of the main character, Leopold Bloom. It's allegedly the day that Nora first struck him off in the suburb of Ringsend, though Joyce would never confirm if this was actually true. Today, June 16th is annually observed as Bloom's Day, a day of commemoration and celebrations of the life of James Joyce. And to James's credit, unlike the rest of the holier-than-thou judgy assholes at the time, he fell in love with her, instead of thinking of her as a loose woman for just having a sexuality. And Nora was just as in love with James Joyce. Within that first week, she wrote him a letter saying, My precious darling, a line to let you know I can't possibly meet you this evening, as we are busy, but if it is convenient for you on Saturday evening, same place, with love from N. Barnacle, excuse writing in haste. They soon spent all of their free time together, which James's bros of friends totally loved. And all summer, Nora wouldn't totally give in to sleeping with James, but gave him, as she said, chirruping kisses. And he gave her a 25 minute kiss upon thy neck. But if his hand strayed a little too close to her nether regions, she'd push it away and be like, uh-uh, it's much more sinful for you to touch me than for me to touch you. Because, okay. He published two love poems inspired by her, which she memorized. And James is like, should we, should we leave Ireland? And Nora's like, yes, we should. Take me, take me, take me, take me. And James is like, calm the fuck down. I am in no position to be supporting another person and I don't want a wife. I'm a drunk. I'm totally in opposition to the present social order of society. Christianity is bullshit. Marriage is bullshit. Home is bullshit. Virtue is bullshit. Classes of life are bullshit. And religious doctrines are bullshit. It's all bullshit. So he gets this job offer to be an English teacher in Zurich, Switzerland. And Nora goes, I don't care if it's bullshit. Let's do this thing. And they run away together unmarried, which is this colossal fucking deal at the time. You have to appreciate the risk Nora's taking by doing this. She's burning every bridge, she doesn't speak anything but English, and would be basically unemployable if James decided to break up with her at any point and cease supporting her. They were only 22 and 20 as they set off to Zurich. Once they arrived, Joyce found out he had been swindled, and nobody knew what the hell he was actually doing there. The director felt bad for him and sent him to Austria, where he finally found a teaching position. 
In 1905, Nora gave birth to their first child, Giorgio. And then in 1907, she gave birth to a daughter, Lucia. Around this time, Nora wrote letters to her sister, complaining about James drinking and money wasting. She confessed that his writings didn't make any goddamn sense and were obscure as hell. Though she maintained she was fiercely proud of him, she sometimes wished he would have been a musician instead of a writer. In 1909, James went back to Dublin to visit his dad and work on getting his book, Dubliners, published. And Nora's like, since they haven't invented smartphones yet and I can't just send him some sex, I'm gonna send him some absolutely porny letters. She said she wanted to keep him away from prostitutes when the old fever of love struck. Supposedly, James Joyce, who never used obscenity when he spoke, got a hard on just looking at the naughty words his wife was writing to him. He described the language as brief, brutal, irresistible, and devilish, like the act itself. And he wasn't wrong. Her letters are a little tougher to find and were presumed lost until very recently. James Joyce, on the other hand, has as many dirty letters as you can handle. Now these are the cleanest excerpts I could find. They're absolutely pornographic. They're primary sources, and I'm going to do my best reading them. I can't promise you it will be a clear reading, that it will be a professional reading, or that it will be anything like what you've come to expect from the Dirty Bits podcast, but we have done our best to include only the PG-13 excerpts. And now, a reading from James Joyce, the selected letters of James Joyce. <coughs> You had an arse full of farts that night, darling, and I effed them out of you. Big, fat fellows, long, windy ones, quick little merry cracks, and a lot of tiny little naughty farties, ending in a long gush from your hole. Darling, darling, tonight I have such a wild lust for your body that if you were here beside me, and even if you told me with your own lips that half the red-headed louts of Galway had had a fuck at you before me, I would still rush at you with desire. Nora, my faithful darling, my sweet-eyed blackguard schoolgirl, be my whore, my mistress, as much as you like, my little friggin' mistress, my little fucking whore. <laughs> you are always my beautiful wild flower of the hedges, my dark blue, rain-drenched flower. I hope Nora will let off no end of her farts in my face, so that I may know their smell also. The smallest things give me a great cock stand, a whorish movement of your mouth, a little brown stain on the seat of your white drawers, a sudden dirty word spluttered out by your wet lips, a sudden immodest noise made by you behind, and then a bad smell slowly curling up out of your backside. And these are the tamest PG-13 excerpts I felt I could share on the Dirty Bits. For much, much, much more explicit love letters, simply Google James Joyce love letters and revel in their absolute X-rated glory. They seem to be passionately in love from what I could tell in the sources I found, even as Joyce gained fame as an avant-garde writer. The couple even tried to secretly get married in 1931. But they were hounded by paparazzi, so of course, everyone found out. On January 11, 1941, James underwent surgery in Zurich for a perforated ulcer. While he initially improved, he relapsed the following day and fell into a coma, despite several transfusions. He woke up at 2 a.m. on January 13th and asked the nurse to call his wife and son. He lost consciousness again while they were on their way and died 15 minutes later. He was a little less than a month away from turning 59 years old. When the arrangements for Joyce's burial were being made, a Catholic priest offered a religious service, which Joyce's wife Nora declined, saying, I couldn't do that to him. While there were two senior Irish diplomats in Switzerland at the time, neither attended James's funeral and the Irish government declined Nora's offer to permit the return of her husband's remains back to his birth country. Nora passed away 10 years later, and she's buried at his side. Thanks for listening. If you have any comments or corrections, feel free to email us 
at tawny at tawnyvoice.com. Or let us know on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or on our website, tawnyvoice.com. See you next Tuesday.